works. Do you know who wins every single argument? My wife. My wife. Yeah, we did. Good answer. <laughs> the answer changes when you get married, right? No. The person who wins every single argument is the first person to stop arguing. If we want to share this message properly, if we don't want to run into the questions of the objections of what about this and what about that, we have to be positive, we have to be patient. So I want to tell you a little bit about my story and how it relates to this and why I care so much about the understanding this is a political, a, excuse me, a philosophical message rather than as a political message. I was in high school when I first became a libertarian in name only and it was because I was told, hey, you're going to be voting soon. Do you want to be a Republican or Democrat? And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't have a choice. I have to be totally freaking lame, really? I thought this was America. What are my options? There's got to be something else, right? Uh, well, there's those crazy people who call themselves libertarians and they like to be left alone. And I was a punk kid who already got kicked out of a high school one. So I was like, yeah, <laughs> leave me alone. Sign me up for that, right? And I was given the message as socially liberal, fiscally conservative, and that didn't stop me from enlisting in the United States Marine Corps. Yes, if you couldn't tell from the stupid look on my face, I like to learn the hard way. <laughs> it didn't stop me from volunteering to go to Fallujah in 2004 with the Civil Affairs team. We were attached to an infantry company during the battle, uh, first battle of Fallujah in April 2004. If you don't know your military, modern military history, that's okay, you probably shouldn't. The first battle of Fallujah was precipitated by four Blackwater security agents driving across the southern bridge over the Euphrates. We called them George Washington. They were immediately ambushed, strung up, and burned on the northern bridge where I ran a checkpoint. We called it the Brooklyn Bridge. And one of the nights during the siege of Fallujah, and this is a story I really... Iraq. Yes, Fallujah, Iraq. Excuse me. Fallujah is the southwest corner of the Sunni triangle of... Baghdad, Fallujah, and Tikrit, Saddam's hometown. And it was the place where all the fighting was after the invasion, or at least the bulk of it, because the Baathists had, gone, had fled from Baghdad to Fallujah, uh, the city of mosques, incidentally. And during that time, we had the city under siege. There were C-130 Spectre gunships uh, and artillery just bombarding the city day and night. And we were letting women and children out, but two young men had been caught trying to escape the city. And this is something that, a story I've only become comfortable talking about recently because it really is the, the most horrific part of my military experience, that one of the days during the siege, these two young men were caught trying to escape the city as any sane person would in a city that's being bombarded like that. And when I got to them, they had already been, uh, had their hands uh, zip tied behind their backs, they had sandbags over their heads, and were forced to sit cross-legged on a concrete floor for a whole day, which is, uh, what well, when you can't, you're, you're not allowed to go to sleep, you're not allowed to move, you're not allowed to go to the bathroom, that's torture. That's a stress position. That's inhumane. And I taught myself Arabic on my way to Iraq with a textbook and working with translators to be better at my job in civil affairs, to be better at helping the Iraqi people. And that night when I was tasked with guarding these detainees for four hours and told it was my job to keep them awake and sitting upright, I used my Arabic to taunt them. So as much as people look at what I do now, they look at my activism, they look at everything I've done since then as, as a testament to, to freedom or, or, or however you want to describe it, I would hope that my life really serves as a testament to the evil that good men can be driven to by government, by following orders, by being put in those circumstances. And this is again why understanding the message of libertarianism as a message of ethics is so critical because it is absurd that for me to be serving, to have been serving in a military monopoly in a war based on lies, it was clearly to serve profiteers. 
it, in a situation where I'm following orders and I'm torturing people whom I've never met and still calling myself a libertarian. We're better than that, and the message is better than that, and that's what actually connects with people. If you're not already pissed off and politically inclined, socially liberal, fiscally conservative, isn't it, it's not going to motivate you. That's not going to turn you on. That's not going to get you really inquisitive and in figuring out the deeper truths about this philosophy, this message. So, for me, I got back from uh, got back from Fallujah. I got out of the military. And I moved to Washington, D.C. to get a master's in political management at George Washington University, where I finally came across the website, Iraq Veterans Against the War. And I just thought, okay, Iraq Veterans Against the War, that's me. i got to have my name on this list. Next thing you know, I fall into full-time activism. And this is kind of important, excuse me, <clears throat> for my background in civil disobedience, because a lot of the guys who were involved with Iraq Veterans Against the War were doing civil disobedience protests, at least going out and getting arrested, blocking intersections or entrances to bases or just protesting places in D.C. without a permit where you're not supposed to. And I got arrested a few times doing that, but it was never really a big deal. Like, I'm, you know, you come home and you realize that you've been lied to, that you put your life on the line for lies for people who are trying to rip you off and take advantage of you, and that people die because of those lies. People that I saw died, that I helped kill people, that I tortured people because they lied. You come back from that with a lot of righteousness and a lot of anger in that situation. And for me, when they said, oh, well, you might get arrested and go to jail for a night or two, like, really? I just did seven months in Fallujah. Don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> and I was surrounded by other veterans who really were genuine and, and risking their lives in anti-war activism the same way that, that we all had in the military. And I knew that they were well-intentioned, and yet we had these political conversations and debates that always came down to disagreements that ended up in matters of opinion. And I really wasn't satisfied with that. I thought there has to be real answers to these questions. It can't just be, if we, if we all really want the best for humanity, there has to be a decisive answer to these political policy questions. And I was thinking like, okay, I'm a libertarian. I know I'm right about everything. I just have to prove it. And that was the start of really accelerating my intellectual inquiry. I saw freedom to fascism, uh, America freedom to fascism, um, Aaron Russo's documentary. You see some heads nodding. That was a pretty critical part of a lot of people's awakenings. Zeitgeist was a big one for me, too. I know, yeah, heads nodding for Zeitgeist. Thank you. Uh, and then I decided in, to, to move home to New Mexico in 2009 to run for Congress in 2010 as a Republican. Okay, sometimes the room gets quiet, but that's when you're supposed to boo. <laughs> All right, thank you, yes. I was, I was a Republican, but I'm better now. Thank you. I've come, it's been a long road to recovery, but your support has been much appreciated. I couldn't shut up when the race was over, so I ended up with a radio show in Albuquerque, AM 1550 KIVA, more positive talk radio, and that was the birth of Adam versus the man. After six months, the show was about to get canceled because I wasn't selling ads, because I was making more money growing marijuana semi-legally. <laughs> By the way, like really, one of the coolest experiences of my life was having a police officer knock on my door. I know that sounds like the start of a horror story, right? Now. <laughs> having a police officer knock on my door and for me to answer the door, and he says, Excuse me, sir, we've had some complaints from your neighbors of the smell of marijuana in the room. <laughs> and I get to close the door on him. I get to say, excuse me for just a minute, sir. Close the door on him. Go get my car and be like... <laughs> Have a nice day, officer. So, right before...